OK, I see. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, we are almost uh, uh, set up uh, with just one second uh, to, uh, to, to start. Uh, I just need to make sure I... OK, I see. <laughs> How do I switch myself? Okay, so here we are, uh, all of us uh, at place. And uh, hello, hello again. Uh, this is uh, Rostrum number four. Uh, today we're gonna discuss, uh, well, mostly the expertise and Rose style, but we're gonna try to dedicate these two topics of uh, different heat sources. Um, uh, can, uh, convection, conduction and radiation. And we have amazing guests from all over the world, actually. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for uh, joining up 6 uh, uh, a.m. <laughs> with us. <laughs> and also Morton, he has 3 p.m., so uh, that's fine. And thank you so much, Benjamin, for joining us that late uh, from Singapore. Uh, and uh, in order to start, of course, I would kindly ask you guys to have a, a quick introduction of yourself and your roasting experience, which is quite big. And uh, I assume it's quite important for our today's talk to start with an introduction. Uh, who would like to start? Okay, Morgan, okay. let's start with you. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, um, let's see if I can make it a bit short. Uh, I, in 2005, I was employed uh, at this, uh, the roastery where I had, we now have the academy without having roasted a single bean. Uh, so I learned everything from scratch, but I had a background um, in, in uh, biology and philosophy. And I did a project on explaining the, uh, the, the chemistry uh, uh, of espresso brewing to baristas. So it was a kind of a, a science project where I needed to explain chemistry for non-scientists. And that has basically uh, been my career ever since. So I roasted for two years at Contra, and then I started my freelance career in 2007. Um, with a, started out uh, the whole roasting thing with a trip to South Korea as a consultant on behalf of uh, McCanter, the coffee hunters in, in, in London because they had a client with some issues. And when I came home, I did, discovered that I actually uh, made some slides, slides that could be the basis of an education system. Uh, and then I talked with London School of Coffee that is owned by McCann's and we decided just start, uh, let's just start to uh, do uh, edu uh, education in coffee roasting. And that was a one day thing. And that has then led to a two day and three day. And then ACA approached me to develop the whole foundation intermediate and professional level. Um, so I've been very involved in the whole education system uh, since 2013. And then I've also been at the university in Copenhagen, uh, actually since 2004, with a lot of projects. So I've done more than 25 research projects uh, now. And uh, eight are uh, scientifically published. The two last was in May and then in December that we have published on, on coffee roasting. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's freely ava available of, uh, on, on beverages. It's a uh, scientific journal. On their uh, homepage, it's, it's free avail uh, freely available. So I've done a lot of education and a lot of um, uh, also uh, research. And uh, we are the first one in, in, in scientific uh, circles to publish a lot of research where we have a quantitative, a quantitative se sensory data coupled directly to uh, the kind of roast style that we see in the education system. So coupling the sensory and the roasting process, that's the, the first ones. And we've also done... Uh, added chemical data to that mix. So we have some pretty interesting, but really simple models. It's not coming out with some really advanced uh, roast profiles or anything. It's really understanding the basics uh, of coffee roasting that is uh, our aim. So I think that that's the short uh, introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Morten. I'm also happy to say that uh, I learned my roasting professional with Morten. So 
Great. So I feel myself a little bit uh, having a background for us to talk today. Um, yeah, thank you, Martin. Stacy, can we continue with you, please? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Stacy Linden. I'm out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I'm the head roaster for Harkin Roasters. Um, I started roasting in 2014. Um, kind of, oh, and... Pepper is here too. We're at home. It's really early. Um, she loves Zoom talks, so she'll probably come in quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I started in 2014. Um, I ended up jumping kind of right in to roasting. Um, I trained for about a year um, with a company out here called East End Coffee Roasters. They're a nonprofit social enterprise that help women who have been coming out of not the best situations come back into the workforce. Um, and they started a chocolate making and roasting company, um, but they couldn't afford a roaster at the time. So I volunteered my time to teach the women how to become baristas um, and then help Doug Graff uh, who is probably the main roaster mechanic, roaster installer for like all of North America, install, um, install the roaster. And then he taught me how to roast. And then after that, I ended up roasting um, for a large company out here called Outred. Um, we won the Macro Roaster of the Year for Roast Magazine in 2016. Um, so yeah, I just started roasting, you know, a million pounds a year in my second year of roasting. Um, and then from there, I went on to roast for a couple other companies and then kind of getting smaller and smaller with my little baby micro roastery. Um, I kind of like to say as I'm getting older, you know, I need to roast smaller batches because <laughs> coffee just isn't getting any lighter. Um, so yeah, I've also competed quite a bit. Um, yeah, and that's the short end of it. It's a very long story, so we'll just leave it there. Uh, thank you, Stacy. And you indeed are a professional who's seen it all from small to big, or in your case, from big to small. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Benjamin, can we ask you also to uh, share a little bit of your experience? Yeah, hi, I'm Benjamin from Singapore. So uh, I've been roasting full time for close to about two years currently um, at a cafe. Uh, basically, I'm roasting uh, at the cafe that I'm from, that's called Deep. Uh, actually, uh, we started the roastery as a co roasting space. So uh, we've just been getting uh, more involved with the industry in Singapore. It's still a really, really small community. And, uh, yeah, what we are trying to do is uh, bring in new technology and uh, roast with uh, the newer stuff. So, yeah, that's roughly about it. I'm glad that we are all uh, here from, from all over the world. And uh, uh, thank you so much again for joining. And uh, uh, here I'd just like to have a, a quick disclaimer. Um, from one side, we try not to uh, to be uh, discussing the specific brands, pros and cons, but from another side, and for this context, it will be really important to mention your experience on different kinds of types of roasters. Uh, so uh, you are absolutely welcome to share any of your thoughts, and uh, we know that they are uh, independent. Uh, even uh, Rostrum is a project of uh, uh, Stronghold, uh, which I see on the back of the Benjamin, but it doesn't mean absolutely anything. We are here for the community and for the education. So feel free to share any of your experience uh, with any of the roasters the way it is. Uh, and uh, maybe I would like to start with, uh, uh, with that kind of question, like... Uh, um, you have been roasting on different machines. You have quite a different experience. So let's say uh, you are approached by a client 
uh, who has a greatest lab in the world, having all the roasters, all the models, like coffee mine, but bigger, <laughs> with all the big kind of roasters as well, and all the beans in the world. So you can just uh, uh, select the tool depending on the need. Um, would you uh, approach uh, uh, roasting same coffees on uh, different coffees on same roaster, or would you uh, be willing to uh, roast uh, uh, on different machines based on uh, some kind of criteria, like for example the uh, type of beans? Uh, um, we don't uh, the type of consumption, the type of uh, like anything would fit here. So how would you um, uh, select the machine uh, and how will you operate uh, uh, it based on what criteria? That's, that's a very interesting uh, question to start. Stacy, what's for what, what's in it for you? What roaster would I use? Um, yeah, like would you would you select different ones for different needs, or do you have any any preference that you will just do everything with the, with that same roaster? Let's have, for example, three types of coffee, and uh, uh, one would be. Uh, let's say a Panama Geisha for carbonic maceration for a competition. And yeah. second, let's say will be an Ethiopian natural second grade for a filter. And third, let's say would be an espresso blend of two coffees. Uh, let's, let's have, for example, Brazil pulp, pulp natural and the Salvador, just for, for an example. Uh, so having those three, how would you approach uh, roasting them? Uh, what kind of of, uh, uh, machines would you select and why? <laughs> um, so in my roasting career, uh, I have had the opportunity to roast on Loring's, both 15 kilo and 35 kilo. Um, I've roasted on a Joper, so drum roasters um, with a, um, oh my gosh, sorry guys, it's really early, cast iron drum. And then I'm now roasting for eight months on a Diedrich IR-12. Um, personally, I think for this, um, because I, I like having control, um, I would probably use the Joper, um, probably for all three, um, just because it's kind of the roaster that I have the most experience with. Um, and again, like I said, I like having control and with the Joper, you have control of airflow, you have control of the fan speed, um, you know, your burner, um, kind of all of that stuff. So it's, I think that's probably what I would use. Yeah. For all, all three of these, to be totally honest. Um, and then starting with the Panama Geisha. Let's, uh, let's see. Um, I would probably start uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> so I was working on a, let's say 15, 15 kilo roaster, um, probably starting at about a 10 kilo batch size, um, just to make sure that I have enough room in my roaster for you know everything to move around, not to get too much contact with the, the outside of the wall, lots of airflow, et cetera. Um, assuming that that's kind of you know a little bit you know softer than your Ethiopian coffees, maybe um, starting uh, let's say you know at a higher charge temperature, maybe like 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, then allowing for like a lower, um, lower airflow in the beginning. I like to start most of my roasts with, with lower airflow, um, and then kind of ramp it up as, as I go on throughout the roast. Um, and I would also probably give this a little bit of heat, probably around like 30 seconds, a little bit before turnaround time um just to give it you know like a little bit of a boost to get into into the roast um and as I progress through turnaround slowly bringing that heat up um and then kind of probably at about 
I'd say like two and a half to three minutes into my roast, I would have a pretty high, high charged, high, high charge temperature going through the roast. Um, then once kind of getting to like probably around like the beginning, like of beginning of yellow, yellowing into the Maillard um, and then at around like 300 degrees for anything that's like a naturally processed coffee, I really like to start bringing down my, down my like burner. Um, I like to bring out the middle of my coffee for these kind of things. I like to add in the caramelization at that time. And then at the end of the roast for my naturals and my carbonic macerated coffees, I do like to keep a quite short um, development time after first crack. Um, I honestly rarely go over like 45 seconds to a minute. Um, and then also opening my airflow totally at the end of the roast to allow for any kind of abatement of smoke. Um, so that's probably what I would do for my carbonic macerated Panama Geisha. Dad, do we want to move on to the other one? Oh, no, no, no. That's a very interesting and detailed description. Uh, let's let's stay on this one for us for a second, just uh, just then to elaborate uh, in in more details on, on our why's. Uh, ben, how would you uh, roast as it uh, uh, Panama Geisha carbonic maceration? <laughs> just out of curiosity, what would you choose? What kind of machine? What kind of batch sizes? How would you approach the whole uh, first roast? Um, so currently, uh, I actually only have access to Stronghold. So I would say uh, my roaster choice is Stronghold. Uh, I have had roasted it, uh, roasted Panama Geishas on drum roasters as well. But uh, yeah, uh, I, would, I have access to Stronghold, so I will use that. Uh, in fact, we actually just roasted some the other day. So for Panama Geisha, I will pretty with a goal of a long even roast across to achieve higher sweetness and more tactile. Uh, like let's say if it's for competition, I think that's quite important. So uh, normally we would try to increase airflow for naturals uh, so that you uh, can remove, sorry, for wash, we try to uh, reduce airflow so that uh, you can get more even heating across the beans. Yeah, we do, uh, I'll use our lower hot halogen, hot air, just so that it doesn't burn out too fast, dry out the moisture. And during Mayat, we actually uh, increase airflow to remove chaff and to suck out the smoke. The stronghold actually comes with an, an afterburner and um, I'm actually situated in a mall. So uh, it really helps that there's no smoke coming out from the roaster. Uh, then for the development, usually we'll do slightly uh, right before one minute to one minute and five seconds, just to give it enough uh, finish sweetness to finish off the beans. But because of the use of halogen, we actually can uh, shorten the development time, in my opinion. And then that really helps uh, in consistency as well. So my approach would be uh, to uh, do an even uh, slow roast and then finish off fast on the stronghold. OK, okay thank you so much. Morten, how would you approach that uh, uh, interest in coffee and why? It's a really interesting uh, uh, question because normally I, I, I go the other way. Uh, normally you kind of, uh, you're given a business model and from that you need to find the roaster that works for that uh, and then choose green beans. And then once you've done that, then you would start to address the customer segments uh, for, for the business model. So normally I would, there are so many other things than just the taste of anything that would that would choose the right roaster. Uh, service level, design, functionalities, which ones are important? Is it retail, so you need to do a lot of small batches? Or is it big scale? So there's a lot of other things normally. So as a consultant, I would come from that question from a, the uh, actually 180 <laughs> degrees <laughs> different. Uh, which doesn't make the question in, uh, not interesting, obviously. It just makes it more difficult to answer. Um, so uh, I, I just uh, want to sh uh, show you, uh, I, I do, I'm sitting in my, uh, I'll just show you a picture on my background rather than 
turning the camera. But you can see here at, at the academy, we actually had, have a, a small Loring, Stronghold, a Coffee Tech, and a Propertino. Um, and, and right now the, the, the coffee tech is actually not there anymore because we're soon getting a seven kilo Cylon uh, roaster, um, um, also a, a coffee tech. So normally I, the, the challenge would be to uh, have a roaster and then different greens and then try to optimize it for the customers. Um, so, but let's say that, for example, this uh, Geisha was something that I needed to, to, uh, to roast for a competitor. Um, I, I don't think that I theoretically could, could, uh, could predict exactly how, how I wanted to roast it. I would, I, would, I would get it and then iteratively try how it could taste. And normally I do that on the Kawa just because I don't spend a lot of green trying a lot of different things. And once I have a picture of how this green coffee can taste and where I want to go with it, then I would use the the the, um, uh, the the relative learnings I got from the Ikawa when it came to roast speed and the different bases and airflow and all that, and then I would take it to a roaster. And in my case, uh, I agree with Daisy that that control and uh, which is uh, flexibility and precision is is really important. And I feel I get that on most of the roasters uh, here. But but I'm still uh, the stronghold is still a bit new to me and it's so flexible with the radiation and and, uh, and I'm not done with playing around and I can't really tell you exactly what I want to do and how it would turn out, but I would just play around with with uh, with um, seeing how how could I um, uh, really tweak this uh, the bean uh, playing around with um, uh, with infrared to see if I could speed up the the roast without getting any burntness by doing infrared and things like that. So for me, it's it's a much more uh, practical iterative process than a theoretical process. Um, I would say. Um, so I, I think that's my that's my short answer. Uh, because of course it's a bit tempting to to refer back to our research with with what we found what happens uh, flavor modulation wise uh, when you stretch it in the different directions so if basically the really short version of it if you want fruitiness you make it short and just as Stacy said really short development time in the end and i think I, that's also what i would go for for a uh, for a, a, a geisha or because that that's what we what we like right <laughs> fruitiness in if you the more you are in coffee the more you can to tend to go light light and fruity um yeah i, th I think that's my short not very specific answer uh, to that question i actually like your answer a lot that leads are slowly into uh, trying to dive into the original topic of uh uh, conduction, convection, and radiation as three different heat sources, um, which, uh, of course, we don't use like one of them. We use all three of them, obviously, during the roasting. But is there any way that we can play with uh, having more or less of each? And the question would be rather, um, is that mix uh, uh, predefined a lot by the model of roaster? Uh, or it isn't, or we have a lot of uh, tools in any roaster to play with this. So is there anything about, uh, um, anything important that, that everyone needs to know about the combination of those uh, three uh, heat sources? Uh, uh, Morten, and I would uh, like to have uh, this question to you uh, from your also academic and research background. Uh, where are there a lot of researches on this? What's, what are the important takeouts that uh, roasters should know? Yeah, uh, I um, So the, uh, the, the fact that uh, your question was uh, for competition was interesting because uh, for competition, you're really tweaking the small last details of the flavor. Because normally, to be honest, when I'm a consultant, I, people always ask about uh, which brand should I get? And my answer is always, it, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, you cannot end up with the wrong roaster and, and uh, give me a frying pan and I'll do, do my best. So, so people are very often afraid to end up with the wrong roaster that just can't produce the result that they want. 
So normally I just uh, tell them that all roasters of some kind of reputation, if you have good, really good green coffees, you can make specialty coffee. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's kind of one approach. And, and on top of that, we have our research that shows that, that uh, color is really the strong modulator of, of, uh, of any uh, uh, coffee. Um, so, so approximately, and that th we have this in our data, that 80 to 85% of the possible flavor modulation of a green comes from color alone. So we have the last 15% that's actually the timing and every, all the other small details we do. Yes, 15% is enough for specialty coffee people to, to taste. So it does matter in competition uh, situations, but if people just add a bit of milk, it's kind of gone. And if you look at the specialty coffee market, a lot of milk is added. So, so all the, the, the small details that we obsess about is only relevant for a very small audience. Uh, and and uh, so here for me, working with the stronghold, I'm still not completely clear. We've been working with this uh, since uh, February, and we have found things happening with the with the infrared. Uh, but we we haven't done anything conclusive yet. But for sure, I would I would start to play around with with that uh, part of it, knowing that it's a re it is small aspects of the flavor that is affected. It's not huge things. It's not that you can make it taste very different because you, you use a radiation where you could make it taste very different if you just change the color a bit. So, so, so it is for sure the small nuances that we, that we are looking for. Uh, and it also something that can only be tasted in a, in a, in a pure non-milk uh, uh, context. Um, so, um, but, but we're not done with, uh, with this yet, but we are working and we're also working with things behind the scenes with with the uh, chemical measurements and stuff like that, but but we um, uh, that better not say anything before we have uh, two uh, lines under anything. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to put this a bit uh, kind of, of an approach of, of the magnitude of difference that 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 uh, that I would expect. It, it's small, but interesting because it's it's in the, in this segment where small differences can actually be perceived by be, be perceived by customers but still small differences. <laughs> wow, there's like <laughs> just a point on it. Okay, maybe Stacy, we can, if we could ask a little bit from your experience, uh, uh, because you were describing your profile, your imaginary profile in quite a lot of details. Uh, so meaning you would uh, definitely want to have a control operating airflow and other aspects. Uh, like why would they, those aspects change a lot the balance of uh, this convection, conduction or radiation? Or is it just uh, for uh, like any other uh, experience reasons? Uh, oh, would you even consider having this in mind? Well, I'm doing more convection now than conduction or is it not a thing? Yeah. Okay, so I think um, I well first starters I like I started my career working on loarings. So basically, when you work on a loring, you have control over your batch size, and you have control over your burner heat, and that's that's basically it, right? There's no drum speed. There's nothing. The burner goes up, the burner goes down. That's it. Um, so once I started working on a Joper or other drum roasters, I realized I had so much more control over my roaster. Um, and even though you can probably replicate, you know, certain aspects of... Hi, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> We're at home and it's early and she's excited. Um, so, yeah, okay. Getting back to roasting and not my cat. Um, on a drum roaster, you have control over your airflow. So I find that I can mimic the roast from the luring to the drum roaster, but there are certain aspects of roasting on a drum roaster that I can't mimic on the luring because of all of the, con like the convective heat. Um, so what I do really enjoy about working on drum roasters is that ability to like really like care, like I find like caramelizing my sugars a little bit more 
when using like a drum roaster as opposed to a convective roaster. Um, that is one of the aspects I enjoy more about working on on um, drum roasters. Um, so I find that that is like a lot of the time when we're buying roasters, you know, roasters are uh, marketed as being good at this or good at that. And that is why we buy those roasters is with those preconceived notions of this is what that roaster does. Whereas once you get to know your roaster more and more, you realize what its capabilities are and how you can manipulate airflow, heat, um, batch size, all of these other things to replicate replicate profiles from different from roaster to roaster. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I find that yeah, it's more about your taste profile. Well, your taste profile or your customer's taste profile, as Martin was saying. You know, it depends on what you're trying to produce and put out into the world. Um, I'm lucky enough that I get to roast the way that I like to roast. And thankfully my customers like that as well. And um, that I have that freedom. Um, but it definitely in the beginning of my career, I didn't have that freedom. It was definitely more roasting towards my clientele and roasting towards my customers. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, it's totally up to you and what you want to put out into the world. Um, and you can do that, I think, with any any roaster, really. It's just about manipulating your air, your convective, your conductive, and creating that taste profile. Rolson is indeed oh. something between the art and the chemistry. So. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a good thing to know your customers. Uh, Benjamin, how do you play with, uh, uh, with this uh, a balance of uh, conduction, convection, radiation, and do you? Uh, for, for us, we don't really uh, say that much, to say, but yeah, just like what uh, Stacey and Morton has said, uh, I think every roaster has different uh, quotes about them, and uh, it's more learning to work with what uh, they have and how do we achieve certain profiles from them. Uh, but we have, I have actually transitioned from a uh, uh, gas roaster as well to Stronghold previously. And uh, I find that it was really, really hard at the start. Like uh, I think we threw around three bags of coffee, three bags of 60 kilos of coffee just to get the profile uh, to taste it somewhere close, uh, close by. Yeah. so. I do see that uh, more controls are definitely great in terms of uh, making them uh, they are more balanced. But yeah, I think every roasters are quite different and uh, it's just more of learning where uh, their strength lies and how do we adjust to them. I would want to hear to show another question, which is actually from, uh, from the audience, that we hear a lot about uh, this and this about conduction versus convection. But what about radiation? What kind of role does it play? And uh, uh, how exactly is that designed in different type of uh, uh, roasters? For so radiation. Oh, yeah, Benjamin, if you could start. Yeah. Uh... Well, radiation is relatively uh, not really studied uh, well in roasting, uh, partly because it is a byproduct uh, from the gas mixing with uh, the heat. So, yeah, it's very interesting uh, moving from a gas roaster, which radiation is really plays a really small part, which is usually when it cracks uh, at the end, uh, to something like you can almost feel like there's a little bit more control currently. So we've been playing around with it, uh, trying to achieve like differences. And um, we noticed uh, previously, most people do develop the coffee uh, quite, quite long uh, during post-development. And the results uh, that we get are usually is, uh, has really nice sweetness, body, but uh, what we have, notice with radiation is you do get uh, with the halogen control is that you do get to uh, push in a little bit more radiation and it, it can, you can actually control whether the coffee cracks uh, earlier or later uh, it does affect almost 30 percent i would say based on uh, what we have experienced so far 
uh, comparing side by side to a gas roaster, and that actually gives us quite quite a bit of a uh, uh, room to to play around with for different kind of beans. So, yeah. So so I can I just ask how does it affect it? Does it mean that it just comes earlier in time, or is there other things that you've noticed that you can get IR uh, express? Yeah, so what I notice is with radiation, you do get to crack earlier, but uh, ah. you actually have a lot more, uh, you can store quite a bit more energy as well. So we have had, we have roasted uh, coffee with full halogen to, uh, to crack, as well as uh, no halogen to crack. Uh, the halogen actually caused the beans to crack louder. So it, it got more explosive. So I, I will assume um, during when it releases what, uh, moisture, the exothermic phase, the radiation actually do help to push up moisture faster with more energy. Yeah, so that's what so far what we have experienced so far. So just an extra source of energy, basically. Yeah. <laughs> more than yeah, but it's also experience. a bit. Yeah, but but I don't know. I have some slides that I could show to give some context to this, but I don't know if, if this is not a education part. But I don't know. Would you? Would that be appropriate to put that up? Yeah, sure. Try this. In the meantime, uh, uh, while you while you're looking for it, uh, I it found it already. Ah, okay, <laughs> but it I need to be of... allowed as a host by you. Okay. To uh, share the screen. Let let let, let me uh, organize that <laughs> somehow. I think it's uh, participant, and then you can make me host by pressing the three dots yep, or more. That's... Yeah. Great. All right. So, um, so uh, conduction heat is uh, is the molecules in in the drum uh, that that bounces directly into the molecules of the green green bean. So that's a, it's a kind of diffusion of of energy going through the first layers of bean, and then it's like a cascading effect into the center. Uh, so it's it's almost like uh, if somebody kicks with a football uh, the first layer of beans. You you can see the slides, right? Yeah, um, if you make it a full screen, so it's a, it's a better scene. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a direct physical uh, molecule to molecule uh, effect, um, and this this goes for the the drum uh, touching the greens, but it actually also goes for the hot air touching the beans. It's a bit so in a sense convection is a special kind of contact because it's still in the, that case it's just air molecules bouncing into the to the to the green coffee molecules um, rather than uh, iron or uh, uh, in, in the uh, case of the drum. But radiation is something uh, uh, radically different. Uh, it's an electromagnetic radiation uh, ray. Uh, out, just outside the visible spectrum. And, and uh, if you look at, at, at least theoretically, how it's different, if you, if you imagine here uh, a drum um, uh, or a hot metal plate that would uh, emit these uh, electromagnetic rays, then you can see the surface of the bean is this green line here then the radiation is not converted at the surface uh, in the same way as, um, as contact. But um, because in material, there's actually quite a lot of distance between the molecules and atoms. So you can see a ray will penetrate or, or just go through several layers without ever touching any of the molecule because that's a long distance. And only uh, inside the material, it will hit a molecule straight on and then it be, will be converted to, vib to vibrational energy in that atom uh, and molecule. And, and uh, so in this sense, that's at least the theory. Um, uh, uh, radiation is a bit more um, uh, gentle to the surface uh, of the beams. What happens when the material is dry is, is interesting because then that, that might be different. So it's, at least it's our hypothesis that radiation is really good in the beginning. So it, a bit like uh, Benjamin, a lot of, of, of that in the beginning, but we've noticed that if we keep the, the IR on for a while, we get a bit more burnt notes. This is not something we found in sensory data yet. It's kind of still our, just ourselves um, with our own biased uh, conceptions. Um, but, um, but that's why we've now, uh, we are now working on three extremely different roasts that would, if measured chemically, would display this, which is the same roast time, same color, but with full IR, another one with IR until just before first crack, 
and one that is uh, with no IR and just uh, uh, airflow all the way through. That's the uh, three most interesting different roads that we have um, uh, found and, and also found um, a, a small sensory difference. Um, so so um, this is, uh, at least from a theoretical point of view, some uh, really important uh, differences between the, the types of heat sources, but uh, specifically how, how that influence, because we, we never feel that we are done before we also have real sensory data that is not just our own kitchen tastings. Uh, so, so this is our kind of first uh, 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 foundation from a theoretical point of view on how to progress uh, with, with uh, looking into this uh, from a, a chemical point of view, but also later a sensory um, point of view. So indeed, we are coming back to, uh, to to what you initially said a couple of like like a dozen minutes back, as it uh, from one side is the color is what creates up to uh, like eighty five percent as you mentioned of the uh, taste, but the reason did a difference of those at least fifteen other percent, uh, so different. Uh, types of uh, uh, energy, different approach to reaching that color can indeed affect a lot. The 15% uh, would it be a lot or would it be a little well, bit? It depends uh, on who you ask because the 15% could be the difference between a boring coffee and an amazing coffee for a specialty coffee person. Um, so in a sense, it's, it, it does, uh, those small uh, differences makes a difference uh, for a very uh, sensitive audience. It's just because we are consulting all over the world, so we cannot just only confine ourselves to that light rose fruitiness because we need to also be able to navigate all the other segments. And this is where we felt that uh, the world is much bigger than this light roast uh, fruity, uh, which also, I like it, but as a consultant, we kind of have to always, always think uh, outside uh, our own preferences. So it, it, it depends on who you ask. If you ask a specialty coffee person, these 15% could be the difference between a boring or astringent or anything and a really nice uh, fruity and sweet coffee. Uh, so that's a difference, big difference for them. But if you just roast it uh, 10 actron uh, darker, then you've changed everything. And then you need to look for a different type of optimum development time uh, um, and, and uh, um, IR settings and, and, and stuff like that. So I don't know if, if that answered the question. <laughs> Quite a lot, I think. I think Ryan should be happy to have such a lecture for us a question. Uh, Stacy, do you have any uh, experience here with this uh, radiation thing? And uh, actually, uh, maybe there is a broader question behind it. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, approach in quality control do you do on a daily basis to, uh, to, to understand, to navigate if you are there with a profile or if you have it slightly different? Um, well, I mean, I don't have too much uh, experience with radiation. I mean, radi radiant heat um, at the end of a roast, for sure. Um, again, I have the opportunity to, you know, kind of stick with that small field of specialty coffee. Um, so I do, I mean, I rely on radiant heat a lot at the end of my roast, for sure. Um, just kind of, you know, allowing for the coffee to, a lot of the time I'll have the burner almost off at the end just so that I can coast through and stay at that light level of roasts that, you know, everybody in third wave loves and adores for their super fruity coffees. Um, but as, you know, Morton was saying, actually, um, you know, there is, and I say this to my students as well, there is definitely an art to roasting a, you know again it's so funny with my students they're like a good dark roast but it it is a thing you know to get rid of that astringency and that ashiness and you know taking something to that level is at a good like a good quality coffee is it's not necessarily easy either like there's some dark roasts out there that are not very good. Um, but getting that proper development time and getting that proper development and no ashy flavors and, you know, more bittersweets and more chocolates and all that, that, that in itself is, 
I, you know, it's, it's a definitely a good skill to have as well. Um, but as far as quality control, um, right now we don't, uh, again, uh, we opened in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so it's, it's been, it's been a, you know, You're a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's definitely been an adventure, that's for sure. Um, so we're kind of only roasting one day a week at the moment. Um, so um, my quality control, is, it's very, very basic. We roast, we cup. Um, I'm a journaler. Uh, so I, I write everything down in a journal about every coffee that we have. Uh, every roast I, I, yeah, I write in, I, I use Cropster as well, but I write in my journal as I'm roasting. Um, it's, it's something that I've kind of always done. Um, I cup, uh, so yeah, roast day, cup day, package day is kind of how we, how we do our days. Um, Every single coffee that comes out of our roastery, I have cupped. Um, we don't, um, again, I kind of do a little bit of like color analysis as well, but we don't have an egg tron. We're very small roastery. Um, so I do rely a lot on taste. Um, and again, it's kind of difficult when, you know, this is an industry that, you know, is developed on a whole bunch of people cupping out of the same cup and tasting out of the same cup and sharing germs, um, which, you know, at this time in the world is something that we can no longer do. <laughs> um, so that's been, that's also been interesting. Um, so my production roaster and I, you know, we have to have separate cups and separate everything. And um, so that's in itself. Uh, has definitely been a journey is to learn how to do all of this, you know, with completely different protocols and safety issues and all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, basically it's for us as far as quality control is, you know, making sure that all of our roasts are consistently the same, uh, matching up with our roast profiles and then developing the profile that we like um, and the taste profile that we like um, agreeing with one another that this is what the coffee should taste like, cupping it the next day together, agreeing that it does in fact taste the way we want it to taste, uh, packaging it and sending it out into the world. Yeah, thank you. You're a hero for working now anyway. I would want to jump back into different aspects of uh, uh, roasting. Uh, like, for example, I think all of you mentioned briefly uh, managing the airflow, changing the airflow during the roast. Uh, on your opinion, how exactly would that affect this uh, balance of uh, conduction, convection, radiation, or and how would that affect the final taste? Uh, why would we need to manage this airflow? I'll just get a power adapter. Uh, <laughs> just a second. So you yeah. could just continue. <laughs> <laughs> Stacy, maybe you can uh, jump to this question. So, sorry. So I'm looking at how airflow. Yeah, managing the airflow. Why would you? Well, why would they would change airflow during the roast? How would that affect uh, the roast? Would okay. that affect the combination of conduction, radiation, uh, uh, convection, yes. on your opinion? Okay. Um, so I love, like, I love playing with airflow. Um, I like to see how it works throughout the roast. I like to see how it develops different roast profiles. Um, so a lot of the time I like to start with more conductive heat in the beginning of my roast, um, I like to create more caramelization. Uh, in the beginning of my roast, I love sweet coffees. I love coffees that taste like candy and sugar and molasses. And I just, I love having the opportunity to develop those kind of flavors in our coffees. I like to have, and I also find that when we're playing with airflow, having more conductive heat also creates for more levels of um, body and like uh, in the coffee as well. 
um, just creating more levels of experience throughout your your coffee drinking, I guess, your coffee drinking experience. Um, and then as I move on throughout my, my roast, I tend to open up my airflow more and more. Um, this is also to abate smoke in my roast. Um, so to make sure there's no smokiness or in, in the coffee flavor itself. Um, also, you know, to help remove chaff so that, you know, you're not having a fire hazard or chaffy coffee. Uh, I also sometimes um, at the end of my roast, um, as I bring my burner temperature down more um, at the end of my roast, if I'm trying to keep like a really light roast, um, I will sometimes also like have my burner very low and then close up my airflow um, to kind of rely a lot on the radiant heat. Um, this will be some, sometimes more for coffees that have a much smaller development time. So maybe like that natural carbonic macerated Panama geisha that we were talking <laughs> about earlier. Um, at this time, because it's such a small development time at the end, maybe like 45 seconds, um, I might have my burner off but also my airflow closed um, to really rely on that radiant heat um, and just, yeah, kind of make sure that I keep the roast level that I want, um, small, small development time and get that really fruity, poppy, fun coffee. And um, so, yeah, but I'm always, playing with, <laughs> I'm always playing with airflow and trying new things. Benjamin, and you, how would you play with airflow on a, in a context of strong cold? How would what kind of tools would help you with this? Uh, so it's quite uh, funny because I actually rose very similarly to Stacy. So I also like to max out my settings at the start. I really want to get into the Maya reaction really soon, and um, I also build up the airflow as we go along. So uh, for the strong cold, there is. Uh, actually no airflow control on the S7 Pro X that we have. Yes, that's why I ask. How yeah, so I actually increased the, I actually increased the uh, drum speed to compensate for that. Yeah, as we roast along. So just so that it doesn't get the smoke in the coffee and uh, we actually roast a lot of naturals. So it's more of getting rid of that chaff that sometimes uh, sticks to the beans as well. Yeah, so it's really quite similar to how Stacey roast. <laughs> Great minds things alike, right? So you recreate it with a drum speed. Yes, because um, there's no airflow control on the S7. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But on the so. S9X, S9X, I do uh, try to increase it at the end, uh, at a, at a, during uh, my app. And uh, at the end, so the, the difference is towards the end, um, my airflow, I do not really shut it off entirely because there's actually a built-in uh, plate on the drum itself. So uh, actually that, that was a question I had for Morton just now. So because um, what I understand from radiation is that it's a release of energy, right? Uh, the electromagnetic uh, radiation from vibrational and movement of uh, molecules and atoms. So during your test, when you were doing the uh, rows with hal max halogen, half halogen, uh, no halogen, was your drum temperature the same throughout? Because uh, yeah, uh, what we do here is we try to uh, gain energy using the plate itself and the airflow remains the same so that the heat transfers efficiently. Yeah, so what we do when we do experiments is that we, uh, that we also always comply to our, uh, yeah, the data that we already have, which is color is first and secondarily development time is important, which means that if we are playing with something else, we need to keep those uh, constant. So, so uh, if we are building a, a recipe where we have a full halogen versus no halogen, we need to keep um, the overall color and roast time of those two profiles the same. So we cannot just add halogen to, uh, um, to, the, to the profile and then end up with a shorter roast because then then, then that might be what's causing the difference rather than the heat source. And as, as Jane also said, it's just, is it just an extra heating element, which, 
we don't think it is, which is why we need to compensate with a lower uh, uh, a temperature of the air, uh, just enough so that with a full radiation, we'll end up with the same overall time and color. Um, um, so, so that that's how we uh, we we approach it. So we we are uh, yeah so, yeah. So that that's our approach to that. Was that an answer to your question? <laughs> what, what about the the uh, temperature of your drum wall? Ah uh, yes think? yes. We keep that constant uh, because, because that's not that's not what we are testing. Um, mm. uh, be, you can only. Actually, I have another slide if you if you if you don't mind. <laughs> yes, um, I wonder was it? Of course, we want it. <laughs> okay, yes, totally it's wanted. actually it's actually a slide from a presentation that I'm preparing for uh, uh, Barista League. So it's uh, you'll just get one slide out of the twenty five. So there's still news value. <laughs> <laughs> um, where I've actually my goal is to explain uh, research design. And here you can see, um, if you have a research project, you have to have very specific input parameters and very specific output parameters. That's the sign of a good theory. And when you do an experiment, then you need to map out all the possible input parameters. And, and uh, once you've mapped out all your parameters, if you do an experiment, you can have different ex uh, samples uh, joining uh, uh, kind of one experiment but each sample can be different uh, to one and only one uh, parameter at a time. Otherwise, if you, have, if, you have, if you have two parameters being different from sample to samples, then you don't know which of those two parameters actually drove the differences that you observe in your output parameters. So that's why I would never, if, if I did something with the drum, that would be a separate sample where uh, the drum thing was the only one thing that was different from all the other samples. So that's the everything else equal principle that, that you have in, in, uh, in, in research design. And that's very important to understand. And this is often what we see when people say they, they experiment with, uh, with, with something. Um, and then you ask, but did you control for color? Did you check that the color was the same? No, 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 because that wasn't the experiment. No, but that's the parameter that we know for sure will make all your coffees taste different. If you are not sure they are the same, then it's the, for sure the color that will drive the difference on your cupping table, even though you thought you did an experiment with IR or starting conditions. Without, if you're not checking the color and making sure that they are the same, then it's actually, that's called a confounder. If there's a different parameter than the one that you think you're controlling is actually controlling <laughs> your output parameters, then that's a confounded result uh, where you've mixed up the cause and, 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 and effect. So that's a very, uh, and that's why we would, if we do an IR experiment, we would keep the, uh, the, uh, the, drum, uh, the drum the same. Otherwise it would be a different experiment. Uh, um, would you say that because uh, I what from my understanding, um, radiation is a mix of vibrational and rotational movement of the atoms. So would you say that the drum uh, does play a part to the uh, amount of radiation as well, or would you think uh, it does not affect as much in terms of like speed of the drum and uh, temperature of the drum? Oh, I'm sorry, Ben. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, so, so from my understanding, radiation is a mix of uh, both rotational and vibrational uh, movement of the, the molecules and atoms, right? So uh, would, you, would you do an experiment to say, let's say you, you uh, keep the halogen the same, but you change the uh, rotation, let's say the speed of the drum, and just to see if there's any difference in radiation, or would that be not something that you would do? Do you think that would affect radiation? So, so first of all, uh, radiation is, uh, if you have a, a hot drum and you've got some uh, 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 heat in that drum, then the molecules are vibrating in the drum. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, the, ra the radiation or the ray is something that naturally once in a while will be lost. It's energy lost in, in, the, in the vibration and it will be lost once in a while as a, as a photon. So it is vibrational in energy in the beginning, but once it's lost as a photon, it's a ray, it's just like sunlight. 
And then it's when it's absorbed again, then uh, when it's absorbed, um, then the molecule that it, that it was absorbed by will be left vibrating more than it did previously. So, so uh, I wouldn't call radiation a, 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 a vibration energy. It's true that it comes from a vibrating molecule, um, but, but once it, it is converted to a, an electromagnetic ray, it's not longer a vibration. Then, it, then it's, it's called a photon. It's a, a particle uh, a wave. It's a weird quantum thing, actually. But, but um, so, so th that was kind of the, 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 the answer to, but your question was if that- Yeah, if so I, that's exactly like, my question. So would you say that, let's say it was vibrating more at the start, uh, when it converts, do you think that this more energy, uh, therefore increasing the amount of radiation in terms of uh, how it affects the rose? With a hotter, it, with, because with, with stronghold, you do get to control uh, the temperature. You can heat up the, the drum itself directly. I'm really sorry. I, I don't understand the question, Benjamin. So, so if so what, what is the fundamental experiment? So if, if, if I want to play with the drum heater, is that that the... Uh... Yeah, no, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, wondering if the drum heater uh, for you, does it increase radiation with the hotter drum? Ah, now yeah, I understand. Ah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, you are actually right. The drum heater is also in a sense an added uh, radiation source, right? Yeah, yes, ah, yes. Now no, I understand. That's, yeah. So that was also power one of my you, experiments. You are, you are right. And that's an interesting question. Yet I think the halogen um, uh, heat source on top of the, uh, on the S7 is a 1,500 watt uh, halogen heating element. So whatever extra heat added from the drum, I, I'm sure that the, 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 the top one has much bigger influence. Um, sure, yeah. But... But uh, but you are right. It, it's actually also a a, a, a radiation uh, and and one of the problems here is that we we don't really know the magnitude of effect of any of these. I, I've always wanted to create this magic bean that would tell us how, how much radiation it absorbs and how much contact and the humidity and all that. Uh, but that doesn't exist yet. So, so there are there's a lot of unknowns, I would say, still inside the the, the roaster. But it, it's true in a sense. In a sense, you can say that design wise, it's not a pure contact because you also have some radiation. But um, there's a, I think, exponential relationship between the 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 the, the temperature of something and how much it radiates. So let's say that you have the the, the drum wall is lifted from. I don't know, uh, 250 degrees to 350 or something like that. That's nothing compared to how much the, the top uh, uh, radiates. So I'm pretty sure that practically it's, it's still pretty separated out. Well, this is just my guess. I don't know the numbers, but I think that's, that, that's my guess. Okay, I want to bring us to, to a different question, which we already started to briefly discuss. Um, I will. I would recall, like uh, uh, you remember, at the very beginning, Morton's approach uh, to first uh, roast multiple times a coffee on on iCava to understand what it can and cannot, and then replicate this uh, roast in a certain way on a bigger machine. I also recall uh, Stacy mentioning that uh, uh, there are certain things you can and cannot do and replicate in a drum, comparing to to Lorin and, and, and opposite. And uh, just summon it all together. Um, is that a possibility to replicate uh, uh, with as much details as we can as a roast made on one roaster to another roaster? And what are the parameters that will need it to be there? Like, would we have a look more at this again, the balance of uh, conduction, convection, radiation, trying to replicate it? Or would we want to use different uh, parameters to replicate it? And uh, is, is that even easy and is it even possible? 
Stacy, let's jump. Let's jump to you. I, I, since you were roasting on the many different roasters in in your experience, mm -hmm. uh, and now you have a Diedrich, for example, and you had a lot of uh, your uh, previous experience in a different roasters. Uh, would you sometimes want to to roast some coffees the way that you used to on a, on a different machine, like uh, from a lorry to, to to Diedrich? Did you have any uh, any experience like this, trying to replicate it in a different way? Yes. Um, so I think um, it's much more easy for me um, to at least attempt to replicate the loring profile on the drum roaster as opposed to a drum roaster profile on a loring. If, and um, why is that? Um, well, the loring, you don't have the capability to increase and decrease your airflow. Whereas on a drum roaster, like let's say um, my Diedrich, I can increase and decrease my airflow. So if I were to be roasting on the Diedrich with full air the entire time, I would at least be able to kind of replicate that, you know, constant airflow in my drum that I had in the Loring. And um, so you can, I can kind of work, I guess, backwards um, that way. Um, and I find that a lot of the time, if I'm roasting with full airflow, I'm getting that more like light, bright profile um, that I used to get in the Loring. Um, but I don't think that I would be able to create that same caramelization that I get from the conduct conductivity that I ha am able to have with you know, being able to lower my airflow in a drum roaster. I don't, I was never able to get those flavors when I was roasting on a Loring. Um, so I find that, yeah, I am kind of able to manipulate my roast profile a little bit on the drum roaster to get, yeah, that really nice, like light, bright coffee. Um, whereas, yeah, not so much of those like really caramelized sugars that I get in the drum on the lorry. I see. Uh, uh, more than jumping to you, or especially taking into account how different Aikava is roasting towards like a bigger uh, roaster in a, a difference in time, difference in, in, in approach. How would you replicate a, a certain profile or would you just aim into a certain color and then just adapt uh, uh, the roast to finding uh, something different? How would you change uh, that same uh, from one to another? Yeah, we have a, a really, uh, yeah, good guess. Color is the first thing you would match. Um, that said, we have a, a developed um, a, a profile on the Kawa that, that I consider just a really standard uh, profile. Um, uh, which isn't fancy in any sense, which is the whole point. We actually do this uh, Ikawa online course where I've developed this uh, profile for that purpose. And uh, the total roast time is, um, is uh, seven and a half minutes, uh, which is a bit, uh, is very, very fast uh, compared to uh, drum roasters. And one of the things that is really annoying me a lot is that I can't really explain why, uh, theoretically, it um, uh, it uh, it has to be faster to taste uh, the same in a sense. Um, so uh, that's really uh, one of the things that I would like to go into uh, to some uh, some more uh, solid research to to really find out why is it that a small uh, machine such as the Loring is um, is actually um, uh, sorry uh, such as the Ikawa um, you need to really have a fast roast um, I, I just if people want to see it I can just uh, share that profile yes, uh, <laughs> here so you can see if, if people can take a picture of this then that saves them the ticket to the to the course <laughs> Um, so the, our idea is to, um, you can see, uh, actually six and a half minutes, sorry. 
Um, uh, so this is the this is the standard profile, and I feel if 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 we go much longer than that, the roastiness comes very very quickly. Uh, and then, of course, if you go lighter and faster, you get more fruitiness uh, out of it. But for some reason, this is the optimum. That said, I can still use this profile to play around uh, uh, with green coffee and 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 get a sense of the total possible ways this coffee can taste. And then I can go, let's say I have on my Probatino, I've got a nine minute to first crack standard uh, uh, flame control profile. Then if this coffee tastes better, faster and lighter on my Ikawa profile, I can just relatively uh, take that uh, conclusion uh, to, to the bigger roaster. So I don't have a mathematical way of going about this, but I have a practical, and this is my practical kind of midway point, for uh, temperature, uh, color, and, and time, and then I'm I'm searching in in that area, practically on that green coffee, and then I would uh, do the same on the bigger one. Given my kind of standard roast profile in the bigger one, I would also then play around relatively with that bigger uh, uh, roaster, and then take my relative learnings in terms of color and speed from the Ikawa, and uh, and then put uh, on the bigger one. I know my, my answers are not, perhaps you would expect more theoretical answers, but actually I think uh, it's, as Stacey said, it's, it's, it's actually when, when you really want to develop a profile, you, have, you can use your theory to guide you to, uh, to some uh, profiles you want to try, but you, you, you kind of have to taste it <laughs> before you know if you succeeded, right? So it's more like uh, uh, you can get some ideas of where to go, but it's iteratively, practically trying it out that really makes the difference. Benjamin and you, what are the settings you uh, play with uh, um, while roasting and uh, uh, depending on what, depending on type of uh, beans or depending on where you want to get, uh, do you use all the settings in Strongholt or, uh, or not and why? Yeah, so um, for us, it, I think it really depends on the beans itself. So because um, what, what I've noticed is um, different density in beans, different moisture level reacts quite differently. So we do have a few presets for a certain uh, type of beans. And then we use that uh, as a reference uh, for the rows to start off with. Yeah, so uh, we, we, we usually try not to touch the airflow and the drum heating element so that there's a few more constants that we don't have to worry about. Uh, but yeah, we, it really, I think it really depends on the beans itself. Yeah, and, uh, but we have not really actually managed to replicate any uh, very, very similar tasting coffee from a stronghold to a drum roaster. Yeah, but we, what I did actually attend Rock Pool's uh, masterclass classes in Singapore. And uh, <laughs> I think we cut about eight different uh, coffees from eight different roasters. Sorry, it's the same coffee from eight different roasting machine. And uh, I think most of us couldn't tell the difference. So I think it might be more of an experience um, kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, were they of the same color though? <laughs> they were. <laughs> they were, yeah. yeah. And they, they, they tasted really, really similar. So, yeah. But it's okay. also, uh, uh, yes, uh, um, Robus has this the taste the roaster uh, approach that that where he actually claims that he can mm -hmm. uh, roast the uh, the same coffee to taste the same on different brands, and and I I have the same uh, approach that it, it's more like just to get to know your roaster. Also, as, as Stacey said, that that it's it, it if you when you when you get to know it, you can control it. And then there's no result you can't really get. Perhaps there might be a good point about the difference between radiation uh, and, and uh, uh, depending on the, the technology. But I, I would be skeptical if, we, if, if, uh, if it's not possible to get so close that you hardly can, uh, can taste the difference. And I had the... Uh, Rob here uh, some years ago when we did um, uh, some of the two of the research projects that are basis of the eight research project in our um, in our big article where we merge uh, uh, eight projects together 
And uh, he did his modulation on the Probatino and on a 15 kilo uh, Loring. And just for the fun of it, this wasn't uh, 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 in a scientific setup, but we just took the reference from both uh, from uh, from both roasters, so one from the Loring and the, the Probat, and and we tasted it, and and we we couldn't really taste the difference. <laughs> this is not a scientific proof of anything, uh, because we might be biased. Perhaps we didn't want to taste the difference. I don't know. It wasn't a triangle setup and and all that. Um, but but uh, I have the same uh, intuition that whatever roaster you have. When you learn to control it, you can actually get all the results because you can always press it. You can preheat it. If you want more radiation in the lowering, you can preheat it a lot. You can have a much start, uh, higher starting temperature and you, you can do all sorts of things still. Um, yeah. I like this, that you can uh, uh, just learn to play with your roaster and, and, and do more with what you have. Um, before we finish, I just wanted to take a couple of uh, questions uh, from, from the audience and in a quick way, like uh, one, one answer per question. Um, uh, maybe the first one will be to Morton. Do you use whole bean color uh, in addition to more important ground color or, or is there no reason for this? I always only use ground color because that uh, that is a measure of the uh, accumulated energy in the, the bean. And then uh, uh, whole bean color is a valid um, uh, measure because it tells you something about the difference between surface and sensor. But that information you already have in the roast profile. The quicker you roast, the bigger the difference. So So it doesn't add anything more than you already have just looking at the profile. So I just use um, uh, um, uh, the ground color uh, to make sure uh, that, that we've hit the same accumulated amount in, in the beans. And then you can see the rest of the information already on, on, the, on, on the rose profile. Okay, let's thank you. Let's take the next one. Uh, Benjamin, maybe you could uh, reply this one. Uh, is there any tip uh, uh, to reach light roasted coffee, but well-developed? Uh, I think Stacey actually uh, got a pretty good answer for that uh, previously when she mentioned. But uh, yeah, so uh, we, we actually do quite like to roast quite light here. So uh, what we have uh, noticed at least with the stronghold, I'm not very sure about it. Uh, we, we can manage to achieve a pretty good uh, development uh, with a shorter rose uh, by having a slightly higher halogen uh, charge, uh, slight halogen setting at the end. And uh, so it develops slightly faster and it doesn't really take. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stacy, how about this one? Uh, when cupping coffee, do you adjust the grind set or do you have it the uh, same for, for, for all the samples always? I have the same grind size for all of my samples always. Um, same amount, same grind size, just consist, you know, for consistency sake, I make sure that those are always the same all the time, same water temperature, everything. Everything else equal principle, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, more than maybe this one to you, since you have uh, quite a good experience with different rosters in the lab. Uh, do you feel probes measuring uh, your heat in different rosters are consistent around? Uh, like the placement on them, uh, or is there like any, a, is, it, is the data collected well? Uh, any any issues with uh, having the probes on the different uh, places? Uh, anything you can measure, mention about this? Well, uh, for sure, they are extremely different. Uh, so there's no way you can uh, take a profile from rum, one roaster to the other because uh, the probes, yeah, they are positioned differently. They are have different thickness. Uh, some are grounded where the measurement point is on the sheet itself. Some are ungrounded where the measurement point is uh, in the air inside the sheet. So they are very, very different. So uh, the, um, the probes are always very specific for, 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 for each machine and are excellent for repeatability 
so they are perfect for product development because you can make consistent or you can make very precise uh, adjustments to the to the roast and get very precise feedback from your probes. But they don't say anything about the real temperature of the beans. And if they had to, they had to be drilled into the beans, which they are on research projects. But that's not something you want to do with your production roast. <laughs> you would need a lot of probes and a lot of work. And you wouldn't get, it, get it, gain anything because the whole point is that you are experimenting and then you are fixing your recipe with your probes uh, for quality control. And uh, you don't care about the real temperature of the, uh, of the beans. Uh, you just care about the consistency of the product. So we have to distinguish between that they are just really solid guidelines, but not any real temperatures and expect very different temperatures on very different um, uh, on di very different roasters when it comes to first crack, yeah, like and second drop crack, and all that. Temperature, for example, one roaster have it like uh, always over two hundred, even for a filter, and some like uh, I, I can imagine dropping it on uh, two hundred on a strong cold. <laughs> it's gonna be ashes. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, uh, one thing I always do when I want to get to know a roaster is to put a full batch and then full flame and then just wait for second crack and then uh, lock temperature for first crack and second crack. And then I, I already know my pretty precisely the playing field for whatever, uh, what I will ever do with this roaster anyway, because most colors would be between first and second crack. And yes, it behaves a bit different if you slow it down a bit, but you, you know now where uh, these probes will give you um, uh, um, the temperature for first and second crack. Indeed. So uh, before I finish, just one last question to each of you. Uh, in a roster of your choice, like any that you already mentioned today from your experience, if you could only operate one parameter, for some reason you are locked to operating only one parameter, oh, well, maybe two, <laughs> which one would it be? Like what would you operate during the roast? Flame. Okay. Heat source, okay, flame. Uh, Stacey and you? <laughs> flame. <laughs> Benjamin and uh, Stronghold? Hot air. <laughs> Hot air. So what will be the second one in this case? No, but when you say air on the Stronghold, you mean temperature it's the of flame. the air. It's, yeah, Hot it is air. the flame. Yeah, so it's the same. <laughs> it's the same, yeah. <laughs> So the second, the second most important for you in this case, uh, airflow. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the same. Benjamin and you. <laughs> yeah. <it'd be> <laughs> so halogen <laughs> or a drum speed? <laughs> Which would that be? <laughs> Sorry, once again. For Benjamin, it's a different question because uh, it's not an airflow. It's either a halogen or a drum speed because uh, this is how he, he explained reaching the airflow management on a strong cold. Yeah, so uh, I think for the S7 Pro, it's the drum speed instead of air. But for the S9X uh, that we have, um, you do actually get airflow control. So yeah, I will, okay. I will go with yeah, drum, drum speed. Uh, Trump speed on the S7X and uh, Apple on the S9X. Yeah, so again, it's a great mind sync like uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is it for us today. We've been uh, we've been together for almost ninety minutes. Thank you so much for this time. For, thank you everyone for watching us. Uh, if you have more questions, I think you, uh, you are welcome to uh, put them under the. Um, YouTube video and uh, uh, hopefully others can reply as well since we are a community and that's what, what we do for each other. We just help each other with uh, uh, advices and thoughts. And more than Stacey, Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thank hope you. To see you soon again, maybe in the audience, maybe again <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. See you guys. Good night, Bye. good afternoon, Bye. and good morning. <laughs> good morning, yeah. Good morning and good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.